Let's take a minute to discuss the E-Fees situation and how that is potentially playing a role for price stagnation since the beginning of the year, since January. So obviously we had a big move in the market today, which was a potentially a technical-based move, as in mainly price-related, not necessarily based on fundamentals. However, ETH has really shown a resilience, a resistance to an excitement and in price discovery in all-time highs. Um, this candle in January is the sort of price reaction you'd expect when price breaches an all-time high. You know, you get your consolidation, breakout, consolidation, breakout. Um, but leading into late January, February, that excitement crawled to a halt as prices sort of went sideways nowhere into a really tight consolidation. So if we believe in the narrative that ETH use case is transacting and compute power and DeFi and really just gambling, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just all mainly gambling, let's be honest here with ourselves. If that's the main use case for crypto, that's fine, that's great. And if people are unable to do so, and I'm going to illustrate why I think that's the case, or if they're being priced out of the market because of fees, then it makes sense that the underlying price would perhaps suffer. We can also look at the volume here trailing off uh, at the highs here. So it was just, there was no excitement to buy highs continuously since January. So I want to talk about gas for a minute. I want to talk about transaction fees and sort of the metrics I'm looking at closely on a day-to-day -day basis to see that just the general health and status of things. You know, you can be looking at the forest from a thousand feet up and saying, what's really going on here? So we have fees that are extremely high. This is in Guai. So these are just gas prices, transaction prices. If you've interacted with Ethereum at all, you'll know that over the past 18 months, 12 months, two months, gas prices continue to rise and rise and rise. And that is, really doesn't have any end in sight because of the, of the demand. So in one sense, it's completely incredibly bullish that we have everybody in all walks of life starting to use Ethereum. Unfortunately, Ethereum is crumbling under its own weight a little bit in that it's unable to scale quick enough for the influx of users. And if we look at who is spending the most gas, it's mainly exchanges, mainly stable coins. The big ones are Uniswap, 1inch, SushiSwap, Tether, and USDC. The biggest two being, by several multiples, uh, Tether and Uniswap. So there are a lot of transactions on the Uniswap DEX, which is great. It's amazing. It's new technology, you know, but this comes at a cost to the chain as a whole. It's a bit of a tragedy of the commons. Uh, Tether is another thing that is a much needed resource as a quote unquote stable coin or pegged to the dollar, just like USDC. These are things that we need as, as traders or people who are looking to get into the market to use as a safe haven, to use as a vehicle of um, method of exchange, etc. Stuff like that. So these, these are great, you know, but people are using them so much it's crumbling the internal infrastructure in, in a few ways, mainly through gas prices. And we can look at that those gas prices in different ways, you know, you can see how long it takes to send a transaction at these gas prices versus these gas prices. And because the priority is based on gas used, then it makes sense if you're trying to send a quick transaction, you're using extremely high gas prices. These are also just to send basic transactions. If you're interacting with swaps or transfers or some additional interactions down here, you can see the prices uh, just get extremely high. And if we look at the gas guzzlers or the accounts that consume a lot of gas, again, it's Uniswap, Tether, USDC, 1inch. And if we look at gas spenders, most of this is actually uh, centralized exchanges, specifically Binance, which is listed here quite a few times, FTX, KuCoin. So a lot of exchange, centralized exchanges here. Now, there are ways that they could clean up their act as well, specifically Binance, which has competing infrastructure, BSC, BMB, that sort of thing. It took them forever to adopt SegWit for BTC. We'll see how long it takes them to sort of clean things up for 
their side of things with Ethereum, it's not necessarily in their best interest to do so. It's in the user's best interest. It's in Ethereum's best interest. It's not necessarily in Binance's best interest. And if we look at the average gas limit, which can be raised with a vote of governance, this is a lot like block size for BTC. It's a little more malleable in the sense that it's easier to change, but it does have downstream effects for nodes, centralization, ability to bring up the blockchain in its entirety, that sort of thing. Block sizes, uh, blockchain sizes rather, total storage increases dramatically. So this is almost like increasing roads on a highway. It doesn't fix scaling, it just increases traffic. You know, it doesn't necessarily do what you think it's going to do. And we can also look at gas charts at uh, times of day. It's easier to send, cheaper to send rather, at, at certain times of day. Depending on volatility, you can think of gas prices as a volatility index for price as well. When things, when there's fear or euphoria, FOMO, in one way or the other, gas prices go way up. And that's usually a direct function of what's going on in the market. And if we talk about the gas limit, uh, Peter, one of the leading devs for uh, maintaining the infrastructure, says he's against raising the gas limit because it just makes nodes and things harder and increases centralization. There are, there are risks here that people who don't know enough about enough for ETH don't really understand. So it's not as easy as just raising the gas limit over and over and over again. So they have some ideas as far as what to do, but there's nothing immediately in the pipeline as far as I can see. Uh, even ETH 2.0, proof of stake, that sort of thing, isn't necessarily going to fix this. Um, even EIP 1559, which could be coming um, and will have some stabilization of fees and fee burning mechanisms, won't necessarily make anything cheaper per se, as far as I can understand. I mean, we'll, the thing with the other thing with ETH is we don't know really what's going to happen until it happens at the end of the day. Um, Sometimes there are some un unintended consequences. ETH is all about moving fast and making mistakes, and that's okay. But it's important to realize, like, what is going to affect fees here? What would affect fees the best, the greatest, you know? What's really going to help the situation? Because if we look at transactions per day in the red line here, they've really plateaued along with um, fees because this is pricing people out of the market, and I'll show this in a different way in a second. But if fees are this high... Less people are apt to send transactions. It's just too much. You know, low transactions per day are at an all-time high. Median transaction costs, uh, mean transaction costs, average transaction costs also at an all-time high. So there reaches a equilibrium where eventually it's just not worth it for many people to participate. And when you're choking people out because of fees, price will suffer. And that's, I think, part of what we're seeing with ETHUSD is that price just can't go any higher because there's just fewer and fewer people participating in the ETH ecosystem. You know, what, what got it here, what got ETH price to where it is, is poisoning the underlying infrastructure, just the, the sheer amount of people using it. So it's not that there aren't fixable solutions, it's just there may not be any in the near, near term. And that's why I'm kind of concerned for ETH um, if fees remain where they are. And we can also look at the mining difficulty, which continues to increase up and up and up basically a function of fees. If, if fees surpass the block reward by several multiples, then um, miners can keep adding hash rate because they're going to be continuously profitable. And if miners are continually profitable and they are selling their ETH, they are also adding a, a pressure on the price in a downward direction. So I don't know what the average ETH miner does, some mixture of holding, selling to ROI, and selling everything as soon as they get it. I'd imagine, you know, if it were me and I had a GPU miner or an ASIC, I'd be selling once a week at least. Definitely to recoup ROI. Um, electricity costs are negligible relative to the reward here, which is another reason why you're seeing all sorts of miners being added to the network, whether it be ASICs or GPUs. And we can measure the profitability of the uh, at hash algorithm specifically for ETH. These are just the ASICs. Now, anybody can slap on a GPU to the network. This is four cents per kilowatt hour, by the way, which isn't what the average person pays, but what an industrial miner would likely pay. Any uh, home hobbyist miner probably pays 10 to 12 cents per kilowatt hour, but the principles are the same. It's still extremely profitable historically because of the fees. And I don't even know if these are necessarily correct. I'm just making assumptions based on their calculations. 
as in these, these could be much more profitable than it's already showing. And, you know, it's obvious that we're seeing GPU shortages as a function of ETH fees rising where they are. So literally, you know, you've got people in DeFi jumping in, you've got GPU people jumping in, hobbyist miners jumping in. Everybody is attacking uh, ETH in different ways. And it, and just like price, at some point this comes to an equilibrium. You have fees that are rising so high that it's pricing people out. You have miners getting fat and happy and likely applying significant selling pressure just gradually over time. And it just reaches this point where price just can't go anywhere any longer. Uh, we can look at total value locked as well. So this is ETH locked in um, the DeFi stuff, let's say. This is DeBank. Um, I like this a little better than DeFi Pulse because it shows the duplicate ratio and the true value locked. So some of this stuff is double counted or triple counted on uh, DeFi Pulse. But in any case, uh, although the total ETH locked is near all-time highs and slightly rising, it's kind of stagnated relative to where it was from July to November 2020, certainly up from January. But again, there reaches a point where the small people in aggregate can't join the party because the ticket to entry is just too much. And that's going to slow down everything. So right now it's at around 8.7 million ETH. We can look at trading volumes. So this is all the DEXs that they have data on. And we can look at these trading volumes. Trading volume spiking today and spiking on, on different days at various times. And this doesn't look as bad as maybe uh, the next two metrics I'm going to show you. If we look at transactions, transactions are way down. We're at 114,000 transactions from 186,000, which doesn't sound like a massive drop, but percentage wise, it's huge. Um, I can zoom in a little bit, maybe see that a little better. But again, we're pricing people out, we're keeping people out of the market because. You're forcing larger transactions, which is fine. And in aggregate, you're just leaving people out. If we look at user numbers, user numbers way down as well, down to around 37, 38,000 from above 50,000, close to 65,000. So that's basically a 50% drop in total users. Some of this is going to just be trading related, but this is probably the best metric to watch as far as pricing people out. As gas, gas prices get extremely high, no, fewer and fewer, fewer people can participate. And lastly, I just want to talk about some bullish things uh, that I've seen. So on CryptoQuant, they keep track of flows and they look at minor flows, inflows, outflows, exchange reserves, that sort of thing. ETH held all, on all exchange wallets has continued to decline since August 2020. And as that's declining, naturally price is rising. So to see this continue to decline is bullish. Now, ETH is tough because a lot of that is moving to DeFi where you can use it to, to short and do all sorts of things on leverage. Um, so it's maybe not as powerful of a signal as BTC or something that is less in less plugged into the DeFi ecosystem. But to see ETH on exchanges continue to dwindle should be bullish for price. So it's a little bit of a bullish divergence when you see ETH price maybe not rising as fast as ETH reserves are falling. We can also look at the total ETH balance on the 2.0 contract, which is basically a certificate of deposit for interest over some period of time until ETH 2.0 is completed. So it's around 3.2 million ETH locked into that contract. So this is also bullish. If you think about supply demand, ETH's got 115 million thereabouts circulating supply. So the more ETH that is out of the ecosystem, the more ETH that cannot be sold, the more bullish it is for price. The same thing with um, exchange reserves. It's just better that it's not easily for sale. And then the last one I'd be watching is the uh, ETH grayscale holdings. So as those rise, again, this is ETH that is taken out of the ecosystem. It's sucked out of its ability to, to essentially act as selling pressure. So you have this yin and yang supply demand uh, fees, which get to a point where they choke users out. People aren't buying ETH. Most of the ETH fees are likely acting as selling pressure, at least in my opinion. I don't see an end in sight for that. Maybe you can let me know in the comments below what you think about the ETH fee situation, what they're going to do for scalability. So you've got that on the one hand, and then you've got um, stuff like exchange reserves going to multi-year lows, ETH 2.0 contracts slowly creeping up, and Grayscale Holdings also creeping up. 
So hopefully this helps think about um, supply and demand a little bit clearer, what to look for, where to look for it, the importance of fees being where they are. Obviously, it's just hard to do or any, do anything, send anything. It's just crippling the network uh, if you're using it. But for me to look at this stuff individually helps clarify my my thesis on price. You know, when I see a rising wedge with all this other stuff on ETH, I'm thinking, okay, ETH, ETH's in a bit of trouble, right? <laughs> so hopefully next time when this happens, or if this continues to happen, you can have some better understanding of what's going on with ETH price relative to the fundamentals.